Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us again with All Things Evangelism. Today's episode is entitled With a Loud Voice. Um, I'm here with my friend and ministry colleague, Grego Pele. He is the pastor of the YE Seventh-day Adventist Church. And um, yeah, he's, uh, he's been pastoring this conference for a few years. Isn't that right, Grego? Maybe yes. a year, two years, something like that? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, is that right? <laughs> Now we're about 10 years now. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a while. Time flies. Yeah, it does. Time flies. Hey, so um, the three angels' messages of Revelation uh, 14 are God's tailor-made message to the world at the end of time. Amen. And uh, Seventh-day Adventists have long identified with those messages. And those messages are given in the context of Revelation 13. So a worldwide universal issue over worship and a whole lot of force and oppression going on where earthly support is being withdrawn from those who follow Jesus mm. wherever he leads them. And then this message comes from God uh, that starts with the words, saying with a loud voice, mm. verse 7 of Revelation 14. So Gregor and I wanted to get together and talk about what that means to us. That message of the three angels is God's message to the world at the end of time. And we can talk about that. We talk about that all the time. But today we wanted to hone in on and focus in on the idea of saying with a loud voice. So, Grego, my question to you to kick off our conversation is, is this, is this verse trying to communicate that Seventh-day Adventists should run around screaming at people? <laughs> uh, no, but let me, uh, let me share an anecdote before I uh, sure. uh, do a little word study. As you know, I'm a loud preacher. Uh, 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 the pulpit, uh, there's something happens to me when I approach the pulpit. Yes. So a lady, after the service, came to me and says, you, Pastor, you preach too loud. <laughs> yes. All right, so okay, okay, I'll, I'll tell them uh, to decrease the volume the next time I preach. So the next Sabbath, it, I was doing a series in the book of Revelation, and uh, that Sabbath, following her comment to me, uh, I was preaching on this text, uh, fear God and give Him glory, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give Him glory. <laughs> so I mentioned at that sermon, oh, sister so-and-so pulled me uh, last Sabbath and said, I preached too loud. You know, let me tell everyone, I can't help that. You know, <laughs> I tell my uh, sound guys, you know, put the volume, turn the mic low. You know, you can't turn me down, but turn the mic low. <laughs> <laughs> so, as I preached that Sabbath day, yes. I said, Sister, now you know why I preach with a loud voice. The Bible says, saying yes. with a loud voice, yes. fear God and give Him glory. I like your hermeneutic But there. Yeah. the loud voice motif uh, in Scripture, as I understand, Matt, is it's important to understand that anything that is urgent, that needs to be communicated, is said in a loud voice. For example, if a house is burning and I'm your neighbor and that's your house, I come home from work and I see Matt's house is burning and you are, you know, just taking your evening run and you're approaching your house, uh, how would you find me responding to you? I would say, Matt, your house is burning in a loud voice. I can't, you'll be surprised to say, Matt, your house is burning. Right. Yes, it's, it's abnormal. It's not so we can see see something clearly in the book of Revelation chapter fourteen. There's a sense of urgency. There's a sense of well, what's the word? It's something important. Yes. Uh, it's a warning, mm -hmm. you know. So hence the writer John is using a loud voice. Yeah. Now, you must remember the Greek also has this play on using the language. That's the beauty of the Greek language. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you read in the English, you're not necessarily seeing the force. Seeing all the shades, shades and meaning that are but there in the, the word. Greek, you, yeah. you can see the, the sound. You can see the urgency. Does that make sense? Can yeah, you does. see the urgency? You yeah. can... It's, it's, that's, that's the function of Greek. It's, it's, a, it's a cinematic experience because so, you can see it. So this leads me to the question, what are the situations in life that, we, that cause us to speak loudly? 
Uh, sometimes when I, I'm upset at home, I speak. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. No. Or when yeah. you're excited, when you've won the lottery. Like yes. If you, you imagine if you got a phone call from the lottery and they're like, you've won $50 million. You probably wouldn't be calling your sister or your cousin saying, hey, man. I just won fifty million dollars. No, you no. Go, I won fifty million dollars. Oh, I tell you, that it's 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 that uh, excitement. Yeah. So loudness can be two ways. Yeah. Like I've mentioned, you get you get upset, you're a bit loud, but you're happy, you can be loud. Yeah. So in, it's receiving good news that enables you to be loud. It uh, you cannot contain yeah. the message that you have heard. Uh, when you when someone is in love you know although people don't broadcast it in a loud way but the attitude mm -hmm. uh, the disposition and i think this is the idea that uh, revelation talks about a the messenger the third angel the messenger is having this kind of attitude of exuberance while the message has a a tinge of warning. It's a happy message. It's a message of excitement. It's good news. And it's done in that bravado. It's in that attitude of, we don't want to keep silent about this message. Right. Because it's too good to be kept quiet. So it's proclaimed in that tone. Mm -hmm. So as you've alluded to in the experience of life that we go through, we, we, we receive news and how we respond to the news is with excitement and elation and joy and being loud. Yeah. I guess, too, if people are dull of hearing, you have to speak loud. I have a friend. Oh, yes, yes. I have a friend. I think you know. I don't know if you know him. His name is Brett Ellum. He's a yes, neighbor. Yes, I know. He lives in my Wolf, neighborhood. Wolf and, Church, yes. Yeah, he's a lovely guy. And he, he goes surfing all the time. We surf together. That's how mm. I got to know Brett. And he he has um he's a little hard of hearing in his ears so he has to wear a hearing aid and when he doesn't have his hearing aid in i have to basically yell at him <laughs> so it's just the funniest thing because we'll be at cathol like at catherine hill bay in the morning it's like 6 30 we're standing on the beach looking at the surf it's me and him and there are other guys around and i'm just like yeah that, that, that looks like a really good wave yeah right maybe we should paddle out over there and, and just in our conversation i have to speak very loud to him or else he can't hear can't hear so when people are hard of hearing, if you want them to hear you, you have to speak loud. And the world is in a condition at the end of time where it's hard of hearing. Yeah. And so the message has to be loud so people can hear it. Exactly. I think the loudness is, you, 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 you hit it right on. There's a level of deafness in the world today. Uh, people are hard of hearing, mm -hmm. not because of trouble with the inner ear yes physically but there's this and we can describe it in all facets the moral declension of society the heart of hearing and uh, you know I believe that truths communicated from God's Word need to be proclaimed with a higher decibel and just turn the volume a little so they can hear what we are trying to communicate so it's not necessarily the decibels now i think it's more of uh or the sound or the volume i think the urgency mm -hmm. as well can speak volumes i don't know if you heard the expression the silence is deafening yes the silence is deafening when, when I look at this text, sometimes the, the world is in a silence. Silent from hearing the word of God. Or silent to hearing what God wants for his people. Yeah. And the bold preaching is going to crack open for a message to take root in the hearts and minds of God's people, mm -hmm. of people at large. Yep. And, you know, it, it, I love what you said in regards to, it's not about the actual volume on a physical level, yeah. but the word loud doesn't just mean, like, audibly loud. Yeah. It can mean distinct, like with, with, with D 
deep distinction. So, you know, if I, if I have a very bright and colorful outfit on, kind of like the shirt you have on. There's right one now, I'm wearing now. People would say- It looks good, eh? There's a loudness to it because there's a <laughs> yes. sharpness to it. Yeah. There's a distinction to it. And so, you know, saying with a loud voice doesn't mean, as I was joking decimal, around at the yeah. beginning, that you run around screaming at people. It just means you're unashamed of the gospel. You, you share it without hesitation, without fear, without self-consciousness. This is God's message. If, if God delivers this message to the world and says, basically, if it's God delivering this message to the world, it's very important, it's essential, it's vital, and it should be preached with a, quote, loud voice, not audibly loud, but with you know, force and power and conviction. Uh, it's almost like saying, you know, spoken as if you really believe it. Like saying Correct. with a voice that reflects that the people saying it actually believe it. Fear God and give Him glory mm. for the hour mm. of His judgment mm. has come. Yeah. Before we say fear God and give Him glory, that's one of the first angel's message. Before we articulate the fact that this is what God wants us to communicate to the world, to fear God, yeah. give Him glory. Why? Because the hour of His judgment is come. But John is giving us an indication of how you approach that message, the attitude you need to have mm -hmm. to proclaim this message, yeah. uh, the disposition you need to have to do this. Basically, a qualifier saying in a loud voice, in a distinctive voice. In other words, mm. there are many voices that are being preaching yes. uh, a message, they, they are, and they're saying it loudly too. Right. But what is the distinctive sound that you want to communicate for the times that we are living in? Mm. And in our Christian parl Adventist parlance, we, we have this motif or feature of present truth that we are familiar with as Adventists. Uh, truth that is present, relevant for 2020 and beyond. Mm -hmm. Relevant to the times. Yeah. So saying in the loud voice brings in all these concepts. Yes. The attitude, the disposition, mm -hmm. the urgency, the tone, the yeah. attitude. Your life is encapsulated saying in a loud voice. Voice is important, Matt, I believe. When I speak to you over the phone, I know this is Matt Para's voice. It has a distinct tone to it. Each voice is different. And being a singer, as you know, I, I, I like uh, to understand voice, and every voice is beautiful. It may not sound musical, but it's beautiful in the... <laughs> That's very nice of you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's it, ironic that you're saying that to me. Yeah, you can sing good and I yeah, can't yeah. sing. No, no, no. It's not that. diplomatic of you. <laughs> but the yes. voice, you cannot separate the, because the voice brings to you the picture of someone's face. So saying with a loud voice, what voice are we using? We're using a loud voice, but... Sometimes we can be using someone else's voice. So we need to use our own voice and allow the, the spirit to empower that voice. Yeah. So your voice doesn't need to be a Billy Graham voice. It doesn't need to be a E. E. Cleveland or Bradford or C.D. Brooks or Mark Finley or David Ashrick for that matter. But it's your voice that God wants to use. It's powerful. So I have two stories yeah. uh, about loud voices. I went, I went to Coffs Harbor on holiday two weeks ago. It was awesome for a week with my sons. And we spent a lot of time playing tennis in the miniature tennis court. And at this particular resort, it's called Boambi Bay Resort. It's a really nice place for kids especially. Right by the tennis court is the under, under not underground, but undercover car park. Mm. And my boys for some reason just kept being attracted into that car park, but it's, it's a real cramped place and a lot of cars and it's hard to see little kids walking around. So I made a rule to them, no going in there. And if they go in there, they lose 
out on tennis all day. They can't play tennis all day. So they all did good. They, they didn't break the rule. But at one part during, point during the week, little Desmond, who's two and a half years old, he started to walk towards it. And I think it's because a tennis ball went in right. to the car park area and there was a car right at that moment. And I could see the car in there and it was backing up towards the entrance. And he was running full speed towards that. The, if he if he would have continued unimpeded, if I wouldn't have done something to stop his course, he was dead, hmm. like dead. I looked, I saw it. What kind of emotion is produced inside of me oh. as a dad? You know, and that's my son. Face, and he's so, so precious, so yeah. small, so innocent, so weak, and he's he's marching straight towards the back end of a big steel vehicle that will crush him and I don't I could never duplicate the sound of my voice you know in a, in a kind of by acting you know acting yeah, yeah. Out. but the way I spoke man it was a loud voice yeah. but it wasn't just loud audibly there was a concern yeah a care in my voice that he heard and he never obeys me as good as he obeyed me when he heard my voice because he heard something in my voice like what you're saying yeah. He heard something in my voice that made it so clear to him that he had to stop, that he had to obey me, that he stopped. Yeah. I, I mean, at our house, he, he I, I tell him, stop, 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 stop all the time. Never doesn't stop. stop. He never listens. Never stops. Never yeah. listens. But at that moment, he listened. Hallelujah. So I think that's kind of what it's saying. Yeah. The world will listen to you when you speak in that kind of voice because you see what the scripture says is going to happen. Yeah. And the innocent children of God are walking towards the road and they're going to be crushed and it's going to be disastrous and terrible. And if you care, then you should speak in a loud voice. Yes. I love that illustration, Matt. Mm. It's a profound illustration to uh, uh, understand uh, this particular text because that voice enables someone to communicate the intent. And in your case, somehow that little kid mm -hmm. heard not the scare, but some way, subliminally, it penetrated his brain to stop or to take action. You know, it's the voice of the loving father. Yeah. You know, and, well, and, and this is something <clears throat> that saying with a loud voice, we think uh, of the decibels and we think of how, uh, how big the sound must be. But things can be said so much in a still small voice that can make a difference. Mm. Yeah. So I think it's, it's a powerful concept that the writer to the book of Revelation, John, he uses this kind of uh, approach, saying with a loud voice. And also in Revelation 5.12, I think, saying with a loud voice is there too. And in many mm. cases in the Bible, you know, like, We've just shared earlier, Jesus at the tomb of Lazarus, called out Lazarus with a loud voice. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, that element of loudness can also be an element of gentleness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's awesome. So I was in so one story, and then I'm going to say something about the three angels' messages, and then we'll finish for the day. But my mom used to come in the room when I was a kid. And say, honey, it's time to get up. And I'd go, oh, okay, mom, I'll, I'll be right up. She'd leave the room. And then you'd go straight back to sleep. And then she'd come in again and say, a little louder. Honey, come on, get up, get up. I'd be like, oh, okay, yeah, mom. And I'd sit up in the bed, oh, yeah, I'm getting up. And then she'd walk out the room and I'd just lay right down. And then she'd come in the third time and say, hey, get up. Like, even louder. And then I'd, okay, yeah, sure. I'd jump out of bed. And even still, this is an actual specific occasion. And then I got back into bed again. And then the last time she came in, it was the fourth time she came in. And she just started screaming, get up. And I mean, I just I jumped up with my clothes <laughs> on and got up. You know, So sometimes it, you need to speak with a loud voice or else people won't hear you. But in Revelation 14, 6, it says, I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach. So this is being said after five verses have been expended on describing those who do mm. not comply with what's happening in Revelation 13. Mm. 
Mm. So you have the Revelation 13 situation where the whole world is just wondering. accepting this sign of allegiance to man and man's authority wandering and man's after power. The beast, yeah. Wandering after man's way of worshiping. And then you've got this select this other group of people who are shown in contrast and they're following the lamb wherever he goes, even in spite of all that crazy stuff that's happening. Mm -hmm. And then and then there's this message delivered, you know, to the world, which, you know, presumably is their message. Obviously it is. Contextually, that's their message. The message of these people who don't follow that beast system. Um, and they have the everlasting gospel to preach. Um, oftentimes Adventist pastors say, see, we've got to preach the gospel before we preach the three angels' messages. But that's not what the text says. It says <laughs> the angel has the everlasting gospel to preach. Yes. And then it says saying, and the three angels' messages there yeah. are then said. So the three angels' messages, I think, if you understand the text correctly, are articulations of, or are an articulation, articulation of, the everlasting gospel. Mm -hmm. But that, that brings my mind to this place where I say, well, how is that the case? Mm -hmm. like, how is that the case? How are those three angels preaches, preaching the good news, right, of who God is? Well, I was thinking, if you're in the context of Revelation 13, what better news could you hear than the, a judgment of God has begun because the judgment of men has already been happening on earth. So like the beast judges you and his judgment is cruel and nasty and vindictive and shallow and terrible and unjust and unrighteous. And then you have this message saying, fear God, not the beast. But that's not God. That's not God. Yeah. Fear the one who made. Don't fear that. Yeah. Um, the one who made is about to judge and his judgment is just and fair yeah. and uh, righteous and all these things and so you see righteousness by faith like like be righteous by faith in the one who made everything at the beginning perfect and who gave us the sabbath sign that is a sign of us resting in his works you know you've got this idea of like the the, the third angel you know like don't accept the mark of the beast uh don't worship the image of the beast if you do it's gonna be consequences and that. Like, how's that righteousness by faith? How's that the gospel? And I'm thinking, well, of course it's righteousness by faith because that's the message that is being expressed by those who don't trust in men mm. because they don't accept the mark of man's authority. Yeah. They don't accept man's judgment of things. They purely accept God's judgment, so they rest fully. They rest wholly in Jesus and in the word of Jesus. Mm. And so, yeah, there's more that could be said, and I, I, I'm not going to say it well in this short time frame, but I just think... It's important for us to realize that the three angels' messages is not like an add-on to the everlasting gospel. Mm. It is, if preached correctly, an expression of the everlasting gospel for the people at the end of time. And if you've been brutalized by those, like if you just imagine, like, like if you were in the Middle Ages, right, and the church was like torturing your cousin. Mm. Like I went to, I went, I've been to Europe and seen all those torture chambers mm. at the bottom of the churches. Catacombs. Bro, like, like I went to a church in Germany where they have a full full fledged torture chamber underneath it, bro. Like the most scary, just looking at these things Jeez, scares right. you, brother. And they had a little oven there. They have these little ovens. They're like a steel fireplace, like we have in Australia, yeah. but they're big enough to stick people in. And they stick three or four people in these things, and they slow cook them, and they get the heat inside of these steel boxes so hot that that they people in there. We're just like, they'd pass out and they're cooking, but they're cooking so slowly they don't die. And they just let them out for an hour and then put them back in there for another day or two. And they just do this for people just not accepting Torturing, yeah. the, the standard faith, the standard belief system of the church at the time. Now, if you would have heard someone preaching Revelation 14 and verse 8, and Babylon has fallen, has fallen, and said, that Christianity is not Christianity, that's paganism confused with Christianity, would that be good news? Bro, I almost wanted to say a, a bad word, H-E-L-L, -L, but I didn't yeah. say it. Heck yeah. Of course. What better news would there be to someone brutalized by false Christianity than that? that's not Jesus? Yeah. That's good news, man. That's good news. Absolute good news. Matt, that, that, that is very sobering, your, your description of what transpired in the medieval church. What this book of Revelation 14, these three angels' messages are called to do, and I believe the Adventist church is assigned this. This is our marching orders. Mm -hmm. If we don't do this, we are violating 
what those people in those days were tortured for. Mm. They stood up for this. I mean, the truth that they were familiar with at that time for them. So preaching this message is also advocating for the atrocities that were perpetrated on the church, by the church at that time. So people who say we got to preach the gospel first and then preach this, I think it's a fallacious argument because you cannot separate the gospel from this. It is the gospel. It's the everlasting gospel. And there's a qualifier saying with a loud voice, uh, fear God and give him glory for the hour is judgment uh, and worship him that made heaven and the earth. Well, of the six says, mm-hmm. flying in midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel. So the, yeah. the, this, this is the everlasting. I wish we had more time to unpack what everlasting means yeah. and what e- everlasting means. It doesn't go out of fashion. It lasts forever. Oh, right. It has this eternal significance and that's the power of the gospel. Even when we meet Christ face to face and we are in heaven and the new Jerusalem comes down to planet earth, we're going to be celebrating the gospel. That gospel will not go out because the gospel will be with us, Jesus himself. He's the gospel. Yes. The gospel is a person. Mm. And that person stands for a message. And the message is what calls people under, out of spiritual confusion, mm. out of this situation that the world is experiencing, into Christ and be prepared for the Christ to come. Amen. And I think uh, it's, a, it's a great message. And we are called and charged with saying it in a loud voice. We should be ashamed of the everlasting gospel. Yes. Uh, And it's true. I think this is always the case. It's true. We have and we can preach the three angels' messages in a Christless, godless, gospelless way. You can preach any text of Scripture that way um, without the love and life of Christ infused in that preaching. Mm -hmm. It becomes useless, like for sure. But the text says what it says, and the revelation of Jesus Christ, God gave to him to show to his servants things that must shortly come to pass. And if if we love Jesus, then we'll love his messages and we'll we'll appreciate them. Um, He gave them to us. And, you know, um, to fear God, how can you do that without knowing the goodness of God? Because the Bible says it's the goodness of God in Romans 2 that leads to repentance, Repentance. to fearing God, which really just simply means to revere him for who he is. Exactly. And to, yeah. Well, guys, um, yeah, thank you, Grego, for joining me. You're welcome. I, I know you guys were blessed by this. Let's let's uh, let's say with a loud voice mm. uh, the message of truth, the message of the gospel. Not not rude, not discourteously, and without respect to other people and where they're coming from, but with the full assurance that this is God's message and this is God's truth. So hey, so glad that you guys joined us. Um, we'll look forward to seeing you next week with all things evangelism. God bless.